Hello U.S. History students and welcome to Lesson 1.5 of the Gilded Age Unit. We will be discussing immigration and urbanization in the late 19th, early 20th century today. Um, a lot of what we are going to talk about in this lesson parallels some of the issues that are happening in the United States today in 2019 as far as immigration and things of that nature goes. So we can go in depth into that in a different discussion. Today we're only going to focus on that time period of the Gilded Age. From 1880 to 1921, a record number of 23 million immigrants arrived in the U.S. looking for jobs and a better life. Many of these people are fleeing their home countries because of religious persecution or war, uh, governmental dispute, things of that nature. The U.S. did not have any quotas or limits at the time on how many immigrants could come from each country, so they would let you in as long as you had the opportunity to meet certain standards. From the colonial era to the 1880s, most of our immigrants that are coming to the United States are coming from England, Ireland, or Germany in Northern Europe. So our purple countries over here going to the United States. Between 1880 and 1921, however, that shifts some. In the Gilded Age, 70% of all immigrants to the United States are coming from Southern and Eastern Europe now. So Italy, Poland, Austria-Hungary, and Russia. We also see several starting to come from Japan. Um, as we've talked about previously, there are limits on numbers that can come from Asia. We have the Chinese Exclusion Act in effect at this point, um, but we do see some beginning to come from Japan. We also see some coming from like Turkey and things of that nature. We coin these as new immigrants. These are typically young, most of the time male, um, predominantly Catholic or Jewish, and they come to the United Sp States speaking little to no English. The reason that these are predominantly male is in many cases, the husband of the family will come and immigrate to the United States to get a job, set up a household, and things of that nature before he sends for his family back home. Um, we see this case happen in many instances. One instance of this in particular is the story of Adolfo and Rosaria Baldizi. They were um, immigrants from Sicily, which is an island in the Mediterranean. And in this case, Adolfo comes to the United States in 1923 for the same purpose as we just discussed, where he was going to get a job and set up a household. And he comes in 1923. And just after he arrives, the Johnson-Reed Immigration Act of 1924 is passed. So he has made it into the United States. But when he wants to send for his wife, Rosaria, in 1925, she's not allowed because they have placed quotas or limits on the number of Italian immigrants that are allowed in the United States. Now, we know that Rosaria comes to the United States because census records in 1926 and a year later in 1927 um, show her in the United States. Uh, they have two children, but there's no record of her entering. So we know that she entered, however, it's very clear that she entered as an undocumented immigrant because of the Johnson-Reed Act. The majority of these immigrants that are coming here 
were unskilled agricultural labor. Many of them came here with very little money, very little education. Again, these are people that are fleeing wars or religious persecution and things of that nature. And they're only coming with what they can carry. 75% of all immigrants that enter the United States do so through the Immigration Center at Ellis Island, New York. These are the people that are coming from Europe. Immigrants had to pass a health examination, and anybody who has a serious health issue or a disease is not going to be allowed in, or they will have to go to a quarantine area where they will be kept in a hospital and given treatment in hopes that they will recover from whatever their illness is, at which time some were let into the United States. After you went through your health examination, you had to go to an um, inspector. This inspector would question you to make sure that you're not a criminal, that you can work, that you had some money. Um, and again, many of the times these people are coming into the United States and they're coming through Ellis Island and they speak no English. Um, Ellis Island did have many interpreters that could speak the languages of the predominant um, immigrants, so they could help them out. Um, in many cases, you would end up having your name documented improperly, um, as we're going to see in a video that I'm going to show you here momentarily. This video is a clip from The Godfather 2. Um, but it gives you kind of an idea of what it would have been like to go through Ellis Island, and uh, I'll explain more after the video is over. Let's watch. What is your name? Tuo nome. Vito Andolini from Corleone. Corleone. Vito Corleone. Okay. Over there. Next. Your name.
Okay, so as you saw, as you saw at the very beginning, he's on a ship. He's a young kid. He's maybe eight, nine years old. One, the first thing that you see as you come into Ellis Island, you come in the main building and there's a staircase. And as you come in, you're always being watched. Uh, many of these immigrants did not realize this. However, as you began to climb the staircase, people were standing at the top searching for anybody who may be having difficulty carrying their bags. Maybe you had a limp if you were breathing too hard or even something so far as sweating too much. If the doctor found evidence of disease or disabling condition, your clothing would be marked with a symbol. As you saw in the beginning of the clip, Vito's jacket is marked with an X with a circle around it. And what that means is he had definite signs of a medical problem. And as you saw at the end, he is diagnosed with smallpox, which was a common disease at the time, quarantined three months. So he has to stay in that small room that we saw at the end for three months while he undergoes medical treatment. And if you've seen the movie The Godfather, you know that eventually he does get to come into the United States and so on and so forth. After he goes through the medical portion, he moves on and he goes to the questioning. Now, the scene there is very significant because it happened to a lot of immigrants. These people are trying to process you through as quickly as they can with the most efficiency. Vito doesn't speak English. He doesn't know what the gentleman is asking him. He's being asked, what is your name? He's got a little card on a shirt. So the gentleman that's standing next to him is the translator. And so he holds the, the card up and says, Vito Antolini from Corleone. Corleone is the town that he's from in Italy. Well, the guy that's taking down the notes says, okay, Vito Corleone writes it down. His name has now been permanently changed. And that happened to a lot of immigrants uh, in this time period because of situ situations similar to this. Immigrants coming from Asia went through a similar immigration station on the other side of the country at Angel Island in San Francisco. We know that in 1882, the first major law restricting this immigration was passed known as the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. It was enacted because many Americans feared unemployment and declining wages in the western portion of the United States, and they saw Chinese workers as racially inferior to them. Um, the same fear actually spreads throughout the United States, and many people on the East Coast also fear that the immigrants are going to take their jobs. And so that's part of what ends up leading to these immigration quotas or limits. Many Americans expressed extreme nativism. Nativism means that you believe that the people that are born in your country are better than the people that are coming to your country. This is viewed in our modern times as bad, However, back then it was very common. They viewed immigrants with a sense of fear and suspicion and at times even hostility. Nativists had a deep-seated prejudice about immigrants. Uh, sometimes these were based on ethnicity, religion, political and social beliefs. Reasons for nativism run the gamut. Um, many Americans at this time accused immigrants of taking their jobs. They are real Americans, and they deserve the jobs. However, factory owners are seeing it as, well, I can pay an American citizen, American-born person, one dollar, but I could pay an immigrant 50 cents, and they would be happy with that, so I could essentially get two workers for the price of one worker. So many, many factory owners 
at times would hire the immigrants because they could pay them less. These nativists are the reason for the quotas. They called for petitioning the government to get quota limits to say, okay, well, we can only take this many Italian or this many German or this many Austro-Hungarian to limit the number of immigrants coming to the United States, which then in turn they felt would allow them better job opportunities. With all of this influx of new people coming to the United States, we also see a massive urbanization effort. Urban is city. If you hear the term rural, that means country. In 1850, only 15% of Americans lived in cities. By 1900, 40% of Americans lived in cities. And this comes with new technologies. With the rise of the Bessemer process, we can build taller buildings. Um, city growth was due to rural Americans moving to the cities for better job opportunities in many cases, as well as immigrants entering into the United States. Now, when immigrants would come into the cities, in many cases they would go to neighborhoods that were culturally similar to them. But we'll get to that here in a moment. Engineering innovations such as expansive bridges, skyscrapers, and things like that born out of Gilded Age technology, led to the rise of modern cities. Our map on the side here is um, Chicago. And as you can see, it moves slowly outwards as we progress through time. Cities expand outward from industrial centers in the center of the business district, which is where the factories were located, where the people would go for their jobs, and eventually, the outer ring would be considered the suburbs. We see the rise of the suburbs in the mid-20th century. As cities grow larger beyond walking distance, we start to see um, trolley lines, elevated rail lines, and eventually subways to allow for public transportation to get people from one side of the city to the other. Most American cities were not prepared at the time for such a rapid growth, however. Um, this leads to poor planning um, in the cities. We see tenements. We see poor sanitation, things of that nature. As these immigrants are coming into the United States, they don't often speak English. And so they move to what we consider culturally homogeneous neighborhoods or neighborhoods that are of people like them. So the Italians would go to the Italian neighborhood. Um, for example, the Lower East Side of New York was called Klein Deutschland at one point, which means Little Germany. And in these neighborhoods, you could hear cultural music. You could buy cultural food. You could buy cultural newspapers from back home and get the news and things of that nature. Many urban poor develop lung disease or tuberculosis, and about 60% of immigrant babies died before their first birthday because of the poor living conditions. Now, let's take a look at what a tenement is. A tenement is a small apartment generally made up of three to four rooms, and they're very small. In most cases, you would also have a large amount of people living there. So let's say a family of maybe five, six people, plus they would take in boarders, which are people that would pay the pay rent to live there, so you'd end up with like eight people, and those eight people would live in, on average, an apartment that was approximately 25 feet wide and approximately 100 feet long. 
prior to the 1901 Housing Act in New York specifically, there were no bathrooms in these tenement apartments. There were no running water. There were no lights that were provided by the building owners. So the people would have to go down the stairs and go out to the outhouse in the courtyard to go to the restroom, or they would go to the restroom in chamber pots and then just dump it out their window after, you know, when they woke up in the morning and whatnot. It sounds really gross, but this is part of what leads to a lot of the diseases because it's very unsanitary conditions. After the turn of the century, the New York Housing Authority did make a law where each floor had to have a bathroom and they had to have running water. But still, even then, if you look at this, uh, let's look at our chart over here, you've got approximately four apartments per floor. Let's say eight people in each apartment and you've only got the one bathroom. So you've got 32 people that are sharing a single bathroom. Again, not overly cleanly. While neighborhoods did provide a physical and emotional barrier to the outside world, living conditions in the tenements were primitive. At the front of the building, there was a window. At the back of the building, there was a window. And in the middle, there were two rooms without windows. That's if you had four rooms. Some people only had two rooms. We, we lived in a tenement building. There was uh, the kitchen, the living room, and the bedroom. Now, uh, my father and mother had one bed, and the children all slept in a, another bed. We slept sideways. And then we, that young, that, they all fitted in. So there was, all six was lined up. And in, in the summertime, I know several times I remember I'd sleep on a fire escape. Even if you had your whole family with three, four, five, eight children, you still took in a border or two. People slept all over. They slept on the floor. They slept on the sofas. In some instances, in some cities, you had the beds being used 24 hours a day in eight-hour shifts. I mean, the poor people literally were on top of one another. And it was not a healthy situation. The terrible world of the tenements gave rise to a new social reform movement. Reforms were passed, but slowly and with only modest gains for the immigrant tenants. In 1901, New York State becomes the first state that requires windows to be built in every room and indoor plumbing in the buildings. So you can imagine what it was like before then, and if New York is the first state in 1901, what about all these other cities where people came? Boston, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Chicago, Cincinnati, and so forth. About two-thirds of the immigrants settled in these cities. Like the gentleman just said, people were settling in New York, Chicago, Boston, Philadelphia, Cincinnati, and they're living in their little culturally homogeneous neighborhoods. Um, if you look at our map here on the left, the purple is Hungarian immigrants. The kind of pinkish color near Delancey Street are the Polish. South of Grand are Russian in the yellow area. In the lighter green over near Bowery Street are the Romanians. And then in the light blue area are mixed Middle Eastern and Romanian uh, immigrants. As you can see, there's many neighborhoods for many different groups of people and these groups of people are very different they have different religions they have different languages they have different cultures but it was a home away from home so to speak for many of the immigrants because you could get some of the things that you could get back in your home country 
These enclaves or neighborhoods would provide them with a sense of community and in many cases security in a land that they were very unfamiliar with. As the immigrants were surrounded by familiar customs, their food, their language, um, as I talked about earlier, the Lower East Side of New York um, around Orchard Street was at one point a very German neighborhood. You could go out in the street and hear German music and you could buy German sausage and German newspapers and everybody spoke German. And this was a sense of security for these people because I can't imagine that they would be very comfortable coming to a country they were very unfamiliar with. Also during this time period, we see living and working conditions are very difficult. So we've got our poor immigrants and we've got our middle class Americans see their time at work start to decrease. There are laws that are passed that are limiting the work hours. So um, as we talked about at the very beginning, the Gilded Age and Progressive Era overlap some. And part of uh, Progressive Era reform is limiting working hours. Let's make an eight hour work day. And so these people are starting to see a rise in what we call leisure time or time that they had to have fun. Many middle-class Americans would fight off city congestion in their jobs by enjoying amusement parks, um, bicycles, vaudeville theater, which are kind of like variety shows, different acts and comedy and such, as well as sports such as baseball or boxing. Um, boxing becomes very popular during this era because they see it start in bars. It's a regular man's sport. So you would see immigrants and middle-class Americans go into these bars and watch a boxing match. But as they begin to become more popular, you start to see more of the higher class, richer people in the city coming in as well. Um... So in 1890, we see an average of 60,000 fans attending baseball games. By 1900, we see almost 500 men's social clubs, 900 college fraternity and sorority chapters that have over 150,000 members. So these people are listening to records. They're going to Broadway, musicals. Um, the love of these popular musicals contribute to the sale of $42 million dollars worth of musical instruments in 1900. At the bottom of our chart here, in 1860, people were working approximately 66 hours per week. By 1920, that drops to 51 hours per week. So these people are actually getting to get out and have fun. The last thing I want to do is look at this video that gives you a better understanding of that time and the things that these people were doing. During the century's first decade, the rush and blur of the modern age excited most people. The century ahead seemed full of promises and hope. Electric lights were turning cities into wondrous playgrounds. Boxing, baseball, horse racing, and other sporting spectacles were drawing larger and larger crowds. Teams searched for larger venues to play in, and new stadiums like the Polo Grounds in New York and Scheib Park in Philadelphia were built to satisfy the public's hunger for baseball. The first World Series was played in 1903, with the Boston Red Sox defeating the Pittsburgh Pirates five games to three. The year before, Pasadena, California hosted the first Rose Bowl, and college football attracted the nation's attention. Entertainment was becoming a booming business. New York had become the center for American high society. The 400, they were called, because Mrs. Astor's ballroom only held 400 people. Families such as the Vanderbilts felt that New York had evolved into a world-class center for culture. To prove it, they enticed the renowned Italian opera singer Enrico Caruso to America to perform Rigoletto at the Metropolitan Opera House in 1903. 
while the 400 summered in Newport, Rhode Island, and wintered in Palm Beach, Florida. The less moneyed on the eastern seaboard spent their leisure time at the beaches and boardwalks of the Jersey Shore. Thousands took trains to Atlantic City on summertime weekends to splash in the warm ocean waves. A popular new feature at the boardwalks were color-tinted picture postcards that visitors could send to friends or relatives back home to provoke good-natured envy. In New York City, Coney Island had turned into a gigantic amusement park, featuring over a million electric bulbs lighting the night sky. Luna Park, Steeplechase Park, and Dreamland boasted arcades, water sports, carousels, and slides to amuse the masses, all for 10 cents a ride. The parks included vaudeville tents, jugglers, wrestlers, contortionists, animal acts, boxing matches, and bodybuilding champions producing shows of strength. There were violin playing monkeys, water skiing elephants, and performing bears, sideshow freaks, and boxing horses. Amusement parks and arcades were opening all over the country, though few could compete with the grandeur of Coney Island. In regions too sparse for amusement... We'll stop there for that. This concludes the uh, lesson 1.5 of the Gilded Age unit. See you back here for lesson 1.6, and I hope you have a great day.